Hi, everyone. Dr. Frankie here. And this is another episode of Love, Laughs, and Lessons. And we are in our matchmaker series. And we have another awesome guest here today that we're really excited about. And I am going to hand it over to my co-host, Denise Ray, who will share all about her. Yeah, absolutely. Hello, everyone. It's Denise, and we are thrilled to introduce April Beyer. April's a trailblazer in matchmaking and relationship expertise with a career spanning over 25 years. Yeah. So April is the founder and CEO of Level Connections. April has revolutionized the dating interest industry by integrating intelligent, intuitive technology with a personalized touch, boasting an impressive 89% success rate in forming enduring relationships and marriages. Yes, her innovative approach dubbed the myers Brig for the heart leverages a proprietary questionnaire to enhance singles self-understanding and compatibility matching. April's insights and methodologies have made her the go-to matchmaker for the nation's most distinguished and marriage-minded individuals, including top CEOs and successful entrepreneurs, her contributions extend beyond matchmaking. She's a revered keynote speaker and creator of empowering programs designed to elevate women's dating experiences and outcomes. April's expertise has been recognized and celebrated by media giants like Dr. Phil, who says she is the best of the best and featured across prestigious platforms, including ABC's 2020, Good Morning America, and the New York Times. So welcome, April. We're so happy to have you. Oh, Denise, thank you for that beautiful introduction. I'm so thrilled to be here with both of you. Same. My gosh. How, how did I get so lucky to have April Beyer on my podcast? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> well, honestly, like after I met you, I'm like, I'm so just th thrilled to know you guys. This is so fun. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Fun. Thank you. It's interesting when you hear your history being shared with people, and it just makes you feel so old. You're like, I've been around that long. <laughs> And then you see all these like up and coming matchmakers that are like millennial millennials or Gen Z. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I am old. April, how did you get started in the matchmaking industry? Uh, I yes, uh, um, I was sort of brought into it in a unique way. I was in a class with a matchmaker who shall remain nameless. And uh, we became friends and I started hearing about her business woes and what was going on. And it was sort of at the beginning of her L.A. office. And um, I was looking for a J.O.B., to be honest with you. So this is like <laughs> the late 90s. And I said, I'll come help you get some structure in your office. I'd love to do that. So I started coming in and thinking I was just going to do that, give her some substance and structure. Um, well, I ended up staying for six and a half years. And not only was I more of like a COO, assistant, you name it, a matchmaker, salesperson, sales director, uh, everything you could imagine I did. I wore a million hats there. And I started running the LA office of this very large, large company. And this was the beginning days before there were CRMs. I mean, we're talking paper files, sitting on the floor, doing matching Fridays. Um, and to be honest with you, I'm so grateful that I was there for those early, early days where tech didn't do anything for you because uh, mm -hmm. you learn a lot. Um, so that's how I got into it. And I was responsible for um, quite a few marriages in that office. I started um, helping people grow, um, sustain, maintain their relationships. And that's what I loved. And then when the business kind of became more corporate and structure, I, um, I decided to leave. And I did not leave to start my own business. I left because I just had a little, I, I was at odds with how the company was being run just from a standpoint of how much time and care I wanted to give to people, which I knew would be a successful model. And I went to my brother's boss and I said, hey, what do I do? <laughs> should I be a headhunter? Because I'm really good at spotting who should be with who. And his response was, no, you've been doing this for six years. You've created all these marriages. Get out of my office and go do this for yourself. So that day my business was born. And so I always say I was the reluctant entrepreneur because I had no idea. I wasn't trained to run a business. I, don't, I think a lot of us feel the same way. Yeah. Um, I really thought I was more of a company person. I thought I was more of a second banana. Ha! Yeah. <laughs> you know, 
25 years later. Yeah. So in, in many ways, I was grateful for the hardship and the sacrifice in those early days and how I was treated, because I think had I been given a very comfy, cozy nest, I might not have launched into my own business. So the adversity yeah. turned into gold for me. And that is how I got started, at least in my own business. What year was that? I left, uh, I left that agency. Well, I started in 90, 99, 90, like the late nineties. And I left and started my own company. I had my first client in 2003. So, so what's yeah. the biggest lesson you've learned since then? Yeah. On this journey. Cause I can relate. I mean, I Ooh. didn't, I don't have an MBA. I, I got a degree in, in communications and radio and television. <laughs> so what, yeah, yeah what did, uh, the biggest lesson I think is through what I'm talking about, which is learn it before you give it, learn it and do it from a practical standpoint before you delegate. And I think a lot of people now are leaning on technology. They're leaning on the support of other teams. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is access to information quickly or they hire people quickly and they really don't know what's going on in their business. I'm still really like neck deep in my business every day. There isn't anything that goes on that I do not know about. Um, yeah. So I had to get scrappy in those early days because there wasn't, um, you know, late, you know, late nineties, early 2000, there wasn't the funds to hire a really big team at that time. I was building one client at a time. So I had to do everything that I wasn't good at. And then I think yeah. you get to a point in your business and I'm sure Frankie, you guys agree, is that you get to a point where, okay, Yes, I can do it, but it's a complete waste of my talent and yeah. expertise. Mm -hmm. So you get there. But I think in the beginning, it was fun to be scrappy, hard, be. you know, many Chef Boyardee days in those days. But yeah. um, so you bootstrap <laughs> too. You did what I did, like no funding. Yeah. Oh, I'm on the fourth iteration, I think, of my business already. And I have self-funded the entire time. Yeah. Because That's I think amazing. remarkable. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't come without a cost, you guys. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, that's time, brutal. energy, sleepless nights, you know, I'm making yeah. mistakes. Like I know I have fallen on my face, like trying to do my own accounting early on. I'm still paying for that today. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like, well, when you, <laughs> well, when you self-fund a company, especially when you're self-funding technology build, you know, there are mistakes that are made, but they're not necessarily your mistakes. It could be hiring the wrong team, the wrong dev shop. You know, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong and you look at it and you go, wow, I just, took hundreds of thousands of dollars and set it on fire. Like it, it, it's, um, it's not for the faint of heart, I will say, but mm -hmm. again, it's another place of gratitude for me because when you bootstrap, you're playing with your own money. Yeah. Um, you're getting behind your own mission. And I think people can feel that, you know, it's, it's so, it's not easy to get funding, but uh, because there's other headaches that come with funding. But mm -hmm. um, to me, it is much harder. Like when I look at founders, I want to, I want to look at other founders who bootstrapped because they're the ones that I have the most in common with. Yeah. Rather than somebody that got some really hot VCs to come in and save the right. day. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. they right. get it right. We've been in the trenches. <laughs> and we're sure. still standing <laughs> for all these years. <laughs> yeah. I think that's yeah. why I'm drawn to you. It's like you completely bootstrapped and figured it out. And, you know, you've been doing this for such a long time. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely, I learned that actually reaching out for, for help from qualified people that are better in area. Like I got not great in every area, right? Like I have my mm -hmm. strengths or so recognizing what those are and then feeling like comfortable going out and saying, you know what, I'm not great at this. Can you help me? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Did you return to a client and ask them like early on, you know, for advice, any of your business clients, did you ever do that? Oh yeah. Cause like yeah. many of them early on were way more successful than me in running a company. They were, those were my clients. They were CEOs and, you know, people that had MBAs and sure I picked their brain and they wanted, they were like, Frankie, <laughs> we, I love what you're doing. I want to see you grow. And they were wanna, thrilled yeah. when I would ask them for guidance. Even now, like I wanted a financial planner, somebody new and they refer to me. They'll say, I have a perfect person for you. And I trust them because they're doing it right. Yeah, so I would be successful without, in, so, in many ways, without them, without them believing with, in me and also sharing with me, you know, very important people that help just elevate things. Yeah. I always say I have borrowed brilliance. Yeah. And what I mean by yeah, that is when you work with some of the top shelf 
most successful, brilliant people in the world, yeah. um, people that are doing life-changing work, um, you kind of like, it kind of rubs off on some of that, some of that intelligence does rub off on you if you're a curious person, right? Like to sit mm -hmm. down with clients and say, how did you start your own business? Wow. You run three nonprofits. Wow. You're, a, you're a, a, you know, a global scientist. You're an engineer. Like, tell me more, you know, yes. um, you're a heart surgeon. Tell me more, <laughs> you know, um, how did you start your practice? Uh, so it's really, it's been it's been such a beautiful journey really to know the type of clients that we all get to work with. Right. Like those, some of those people have become my dearest friends. Yes. Yeah. That's been challenging for me a little bit, that piece of just cause I'm trained as a clinical psychologist and they drilled into us early, you know, early on in my career, my education, um, you, you maintain boundaries, Frankie, you don't, you know, you don't hang out with your clients outside of your work with them. You have to maintain the frame and, you know, uh, so it's been, that's been an ongoing struggle for me to realize, wait a minute, I can, I, we can be friends and I also can be their matchmaker and I can be their coach and that sort of thing. And it's a, it's a, it's still a process for me. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's the defining difference for me. I just got a text this morning from a client who's technically not with me anymore. And he said, to, he texted me this morning and he said, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, my love. And I said, happy anniversary. What's that? He goes, we've been working together for three years. And I said, well, technically we're not working together, but he said, but we've known each other and you've become one of the closest and nearest, dearest people to my heart over the last three years. So can I reinstate contract? Can I work with him again? Of course. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, but that to me is meaningful. So I did the opposite of you, Frankie, is that I didn't have your background. So I, I was so, so transparent and maybe that's my defining difference. My mm. unique, you know, my USP is that yeah. I didn't have those. I mean, I have boundaries like anybody who's ever worked with me before, if they're newer, they don't get to go out and have drinks or dinner with clients. Like that's a no, no. They don't get to go out and be friends with the women in our, in our network because then we're really blurring the lines. But because right. it's my business and I'm older and I have a little bit more control, once somebody is a client, there are certain things that I will do. And I feel like to know someone is to trust someone. And when we trust people, we don't micromanage them. Mm -hmm. So my philosophy is a little bit of like, go, go through the back door. Like I am really dear friends with my clients. It's why my success rate is high. It's not because I'm matching thousands of men. I select my men very, very, very carefully. I don't mm -hmm. take them on unless I think I can be successful in those first six, nine months. Um, but because they know about my, they know about my marriage. They know that my dog is going through chemo. They know that about my aging elderly parents that I care for every other weekend, because a, I want them to know sort of my own values and how I think and feel and process and make decisions. And mm -hmm. if I let them into my life a little bit, there is a trust factor. So I'm never micromanaged by my clients which I think a lot of matchmakers are. They feel this stress of like, oh gosh, mm -hmm. Bob, Susan, Kathy, Dave are on the phone. Oh, what am I going to do? I don't have that anymore. Yeah, I had yeah. that when I was with somebody else's company or maybe when mm -hmm. I was new at this, but now it's like the phone rings and it's a client. I'm very, very happy to take that call. I talked to a former client today that's coming back. I haven't seen him in a year and a half. He's been out of state. Um, you know, we hung up the phone and it's, I love you. I, I mean, I am willing oh. to go to that kind of lane. Um, because for me, just me personally, I need that level of personal investment to do a good job, but that's not right for yeah. everybody. I mean, yeah. you, you, the energy exchange is so, I mean, that's what you're talking about. You're making yourself available and vulnerable to them and showing them who you are because they show us so much of who they are and it's just one-sided. Mm -hmm. If we can, right, if we can make ourselves available and open, and I don't mean time-wise, I mean, emotionally, sure. Mm -hmm. It's like, then it's, it feels like it's, it's more of an, uh, more of a balanced, not like, oh, we are the matchmaker and they are the and client are and the yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, the trust builds and it's so true. I, yeah. That's and what I want to say that, yeah. right? We mm -hmm. always say that first relationship, and and I think that you took it to a different level because we always say the first relationship is with the client, but you know, but that real connection that you have is is amazing. I I love that. I love that you do that, and and that your clients feel that way about you. Yeah, because even when I go into you know speaking and I'm working with you know corporate environment outside of matchmaking, my whole thing is teaching leaders how to be a thousand percent transparent. 
because it isn't okay anymore. We're in a new world. Like it isn't okay anymore to run a business and then keep this wall up around you. That worked in the, you know, 80s, 80s. maybe the 90s and the 2000s. <laughs> but for right now, it is complete transparency. I'm transparent with anybody who works with me as a client. I'm transparent with anybody who works with me in the office. Um, and I think if you choose well, you can open that up. But to me, when there's when we talk about business competition, there is no competition when you're making a personal investment. And because then it is about, I connected on a soul level with this client. This client trusts me intellectually and emotionally. So therefore they're choosing to work with me as opposed to another matchmaker that might be offering the you know moon and the stars and have a reduced rate from mine. So I think it's just whatever is your intention of your business. <laughs> Yeah. And it's really about connection, right? Like there's enough business to go around and I'm not the perf, like I'm not a, the right matchmaker for everybody. Right. So it's like, it's about a connection. I find, I want to work with clients that feel like, right. We're, we're vibing, so to speak. Right. It feels like they're trust, they're trusting in me with their heart. And, um, yeah, and I like them, right? You wanna we wanna like our clients. <laughs> and we want them to like us too. Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I used to joke in my office, I used to say, like, I, you know, I, I have to like you because you know, I have I have to like my clients because I'm you know, I, I'm sleeping with them. And I I made my staff laugh when I said that. I go, I'm not sleeping with them technically. <laughs> but when we go to bed at night, we all know that we're lying there on our pillow going, Okay, I wonder if she's doing oh, I'm worried about him, I'm worried about her, and oh, I hope she's okay tomorrow. You know, we're we, we don't know how to shut our our brains off about our clients we just don't and if you do know good for you um i don't i've never learned that art so don't ask me to write a book on you know how to close the door on your clients at night um but uh you know it's again it's a it's a choice it's a choice yeah i can have to yeah, I've been out to dinner with my husband and the phone will ring and it's a client on a date or they're just coming off of a date and they're they're having an issue and I'll go, oh, and I look at my husband and he goes, it's okay. I'll have the waitress keep your plate warm. You can go stand outside and talk to your client because he knows that this is really important. Not because this person paid me, so therefore I, it's, I like Mark, I like Steve and he's in trouble. I'm going to go out and help him. That's right. You want to know. It's yeah, it's a part of it. Yeah. They're your friends. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. So good. <laughs> so exactly. do you only work with male clients? Tell us, tell us how you, how you work. Yes. When I ran the other company uh, up to 2003, we had a, a male and female client list. And I would say our women to men ratio was 70, 30, which was hard. I'm not going to lie. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds really good in theory. Uh, but for me, it was challenging. In fact, I remember grinding my teeth so bad in those days that I had to go get a night guard because <laughs> I would have ended up with no teeth in my mouth. Um, I was just stressed Gumby. because <laughs> Gumby. <laughs> um, because, uh, you know, if you had a 70, 30 ratio, there wasn't enough awesome, wonderful, high level men to match with the women. So I would push back on the agency and saying, no, 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 no. I'm not going to take on that female client. We have 20 of her and we're not getting those women out on dates and it's not fair. And mm -hmm. that is part of why I left because they wanted sell, 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 quota, 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 quota. Um, and it, it literally made my skin crawl. You guys, I just, I am success motivated, but I am not financially motivated. There are two different things for me. Um, so when I left to start my own company, it wasn't that I was trying to make women less important. Um, mm. I just said, I feel more comfortable serving the heterosexual male world when they're looking for a wife. Like that was my, my thing. That's what I was really good at. And what I was doing, and I had a lot of pushback from women. I've had women say, you know, you're throwing women back to 1940. I did a TV show where I said something about how women can give back on a date without throwing down their credit card. And a woman said, you're throwing women back to the old ages and uh, you should never have a daughter. I can remember something so cruel coming through an email. Oh my gosh. And I thought, what is going on in this world that you think that your value is the money that you're going to spend? I am, I am making women really important by saying, just 
fill out your profile, be in my world, be in my database, be in my network, because we just never know. Now, for a lot of people that feels like, well, wait a minute, but I want you to go to work for me. Mm -hmm. To me, it's antithetical to what I feel about the female receiving. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a spiritual thing for me, not just a business decision. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was um, just come into the world, come into the network. I'm going to work for these men. But when I'm matching a female with my client, it doesn't mean that she's less important. In fact, once I make a match, she becomes equally important as the paying client. I'm on the phone with her if she's dating my guy as much as I'm on the phone with him. And that could be months. That could be months and months. I worked with a couple for a year before their wedding date, and that was beyond contract. So she got wow. a lot of a lot of love from me because I really wanted to make sure that I wasn't just, you know, throwing people together and then running away. Like I'm better actually once people meet at the maintain with the maintenance of that relationship. So I help people grow these things. Um, so that for me is my own business decision. Um, so mm -hmm. women are not not paying. They're just, but they have to be invested. And we can tell. We can tell by the photos they give us. We can tell by the complete profiles. We can tell by how they respond when we reach out. We know they're invested because we're going right. to do like triple, quadruple interviews to, yeah. to learn their investment level. I think you said something that's so, so important, the process that it takes to make a match. And I think a lot of our listeners that haven't used a matchmaker before don't understand how much work goes into producing the match. Can you speak to that a little bit more? And, and Dr. Oh. Frankie too, chime in, you know? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Denise, I like that you said produce. Um, <laughs> because producers are always the unsung heroes in television. Um, you know, they're not front and center. So I love that you use that word. Um, the production of it is research, interviewing, intuition, um, getting that person to the table to begin with. What did you have to do to acquire that client? What did you have to do to acquire that lead in your network? Did you go to, you know, 20 events that year and you finally met this one incredible person? Um, we might have had to nurture that person in our network for months to earn their trust, to get them into our world. And then we show up and we put that date together. But so if you're doing it right, I think a lot of time goes into it. A lot of care, time and thought and research before you put it together. Um, that way, to me, it's not so much as, you know, I'm so idealistic. It's I want these dates to go, to go well. So if I put the upfront time into it, by the time the date goes well, I'm not surprised that they're saying, hey, that's a five out of a five date. That was a really, really good date. I, there's nothing mm -hmm. that they're telling me is surprising me. Do you agree? Dr. Yes. Kennedy? And we're working with women, right? We're interviewing, searching, screening women, and they are discerning. So we have women that have been watching everything that we do as a company for years mm -hmm. before they even decide to email us or call us to schedule a consultation mm -hmm. or to fill out a profile. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're, you know, they're not impulsive and you need to nurture these relationships and, and the people who are really kind of, they're selective and they know their value. Um, they're not going to allow, right. They're not going to easily access them. So, yeah, I think the customer or the client thinks of it as, okay, you know, especially if people are going down the, fin the road of financial model, like, okay, so if I get a date, it's equivalent to this much money but they don't understand that you might have you might have hit that ball you know 20 30 times with calling out to the other person and they find out that they said no or they were dating somebody or maybe the, your client said no so by the time you get to the actual date people forget that there was a lot of up at bats yes. prior to That's right, right. Yep. exactly exactly and i love it how people come into our network and they're so discerning like you're saying dr frankie and they have this very high bar of what they want. And then if they're not matched, they're calling and saying, and I'm talking about just the women in my database. Hey, I haven't heard from you. <laughs> but yet, but yet they gave us this very, very, very narrow, narrow search field of what they want. And okay. it comes yeah. to, it, it comes down to trust and faith. They're like, I would say 75% of the women that come through my network, get it. They see it says, there's no guarantee. This is completely free for you. You're in a safe, protected offline environment. If we call you, it's like getting a free lottery ticket. 
but 25% don't read. They don't read all of the TOS. They don't read the emails that go out, the newsletters. They just want what they want. And guaranteed, however they're treating us as matchmakers, that sort of <gasps> scarcity mindset of where is he, she, is yeah. what they're doing in their dating life. Yes. Good point. Such a good point. We say that all the time, right? Same thing. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like if I yeah. met a matchmaker and I were single, let's say I met you guys and you said, April, there's no guarantee, but you're in our network and we'll call you. Uh, do you know that you would never hear from me unless I wanted to call and say hi and see if you guys want to go for a glass of wine? <laughs> you would never hear from me because I trust me. I trust the universe. I trust yeah. d divine timing and I trust you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thinking of it as a, from a place of abundance, not scarcity. Not, yes. not lack. Yeah, indeed. So what do you do with those clients, those people that are in your database that are calling like that and they are operating from this place of, of lack or scarcity? Mm. Well, we have um, now, I mean, my network is so large, I can't reach out to those people individually. Um, we have, um, you know, a lot of nurturing. It's part of what I built, which is I really wanted a business that could um, be in support of me. So the nurturing, the intuition of, I can tell when a holiday is coming up, sort of how many emails and calls we're going to receive. So how can I circumvent some of that scarcity and that fear by getting ahead of it with content, right? Soothing yeah. people through those kinds of things. And I'm usually popping in with saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a class, you know, come, come on into it. I'm, I'm leading a, a women's group. Um, mm -hmm. That's helpful to a lot of people as well. So for me, it's just, you know, we're just reminding them that this is okay. It's kind of like if you're on a dating app, if you put up a beautiful profile, um, great prompts, and I, I run some apps for some of my clients as well in my coaching business, but if you have a great bio, great prompts, really good photos, why can't you think about it like Vegas? Like put your money down and just let it <laughs> ride, right? But to be, to have that grip, I always say when you have that, like that knuckle grip, you're not receiving yeah. anything. That's so right. you gotta let you gotta trust and say, you know what, this person is coming into my world when that person is ready. I might be ready as a human being. And that's another conversation, right? Is that everybody thinks they're ready for love when they need love or when they're lonely. That's not the same as readiness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And emotional readiness is saying, I trust, I trust that this person is gonna appear as long as I am showing up and noticing what I'm being noticed, that this person is going to appear. And what's mm -hmm. so cool is that, I don't know if you two feel the same way, but I feel like my matchmaking career gave me an edge above other women when I was single. What do you mean? You, you knew the behind yeah. the scenes, kind of what it... Well, first of all, I was 20 something when I started. So my friends were, were chomping at the bit, marriage, 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 find a boyfriend, find a boyfriend. And I was having so much fun interviewing clients because I'm so curious and like, oh, I yeah. loved my single days. But I yeah. also thought, you know, we were dealing with a high percentage, maybe 50, 60% of our clients were coming through after divorce. And I thought, well, I don't come from a divorced family. I, I, in order to get married, you have to have your big girl panties on. You know, you have to really know what you're doing to combine your life with someone else. So I, it, it sort of calmed me as a single person before I met my husband. And because I knew the behind the scenes of, of compatibility and how someone, you know, could be, you, as a matchmaker, you can be, I was thinking you could be on someone's, you know, S list, their shit list on Monday, but you could be on their holiday list by Friday. Like that's sort of the ebb and the flow of what we have in our world as matchmakers. Mm -hmm. And I think I just sort of thought, you know what, it's okay. Because I saw people coming in as clients who were so worried that they were never going to meet that person. And it was always darkest right before the dawn. Mm, right? Okay. They'd, be, yeah. they'd be complaining and in sorrow and chaos. Oh, maybe we should get our money back. This isn't working. Ah, chaos, chaos, scarcity, fear. 90 days, 120 days. And then boom, we had their match. And then we were dancing at their wedding. So that was sort of informing my own life as a single person that calmed me, soothed me. I looked at every date as an opportunity to get to know somebody new. I had a blast being single. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> it was fun. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you bring up a good point where like you could have kind of a disappointing date that, you know, it, maybe they rejected you. And then a few days later, go out on a date and have it be complete, a complete connection. And yeah. Yeah. So the pendulum can swing pretty, 
extreme. Yeah. Or also how about you when you match people and someone declines them? Yes. Either, either by photos or profile or whatever, or they go on the date, they weren't really interested in the person. You think that person is amazing. (laughs) And a few, a few weeks later, a day later, a month later, a year later, you've got the perfect partner for that person. So what if we could all know that? What if, you know, we as matchmakers, as far as our intake of our clients and our clients as well, um, you know, to not take it to heart Yeah. when, when someone isn't interested in you, because there's always another train at the station. Yes. And to recognize this is just a process, part of the process. Mm-hmm. Yep. Process. Oh, love good. that word. Yeah. I love that word. <laughs> So I'm hearing you say that women can get into your network and they can, do they go to your website and they fill out a profile like they do on our site is yeah. Yeah. Except for, it's not a filling out of a profile. It's more of a journey. Um, Oh, uh, that's my favorite word. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I wanted something that would mimic my interview process. Um, So I created a, um, what I call the EVT. It's my proprietary process. It's my EVT profiling process, um, emotional value traits. And it takes you on a journey of your life. Um, What happens on the back end is that we learn a lot about the person, but there's really only one space where anybody fills anything out. Um, And that's because we want that portion to be in their words, but it's a series of questions. It's a deep dive Q and A that that, um, is very non-linear and the reason for that is because I'm non-linear. <laughs> I don't think, speak, match, uh, coach in a linear fashion. Um, mm-hmm. I kind of go where the inspiration is. I might be talking about your career. And in that same beat, I'm talking about your childhood and what your dad yeah. taught you when you were four. You know, So um, that's sort of what it is. It's what, why it's been likened to kind of a Myers-Briggs style um, experience. So women can do that, come into our network. And I think there's value there. Um, I'm no, always I want to do it. I want to, you should, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's value there because it's educational. Um, most often when women fill this out, uh, when they complete their journey, um, they're writing to us and saying, wow, I learned a lot about myself in this process. They didn't just give their, us their information. They, yeah. they gain something from it too. So it's a win-win for everybody. And yeah, so I can see all of the matching criteria on the back end. That's how it works in my system. And if I have somebody for a woman, um, it's very, very easy to spot. So it doesn't matter if somebody joined yesterday or five years ago, or she's joining in a month from now. It's like, it's like an even playing field because mm-hmm. it doesn't have to do with how much I like that woman or how popular she is. It's what is her matching criteria and compatibility score related to my client? Because the cream always rises to the top. So when women say like, I thought you liked me, why am I not been matched? It's because I don't think there's somebody for her. Mm -hmm. It has to, it's like a two way street. And so Mm -hmm. I just created a way that I could quickly, easily be able to assess that and see that. And then, you know, I just kind of took all of my experience, my intuition, and I built it into uh, my own process. Is that an algorithm that takes all that data and then kind of compares it to? Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. My brain shot. You're a long (laughs) way from uh, folders and profiles, right? (laughs) Yeah. From those those early days. Like I remember like a few rain dances, you know, holding the, we had those boxes where it was like a nine shelf. Um, But again, because of those early days of doing it manually, that is the only way I was able to create an algorithm. That's why nobody can borrow that from me, right? That's right. Because we had those nine shelves. So once you had your, you had your clients that wanted matches at the top, then once you made a phone call, you separated their files and you put them in another drawer. Once they were done and on their way on their date, you put them in the bottom drawer. Um, There was a whole like system System. to it. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, I I do kind of miss those days because, um, you know, there was something there was something to that. Um, but you know, everything needs to evolve. Yeah, okay. it reminds me of the whiteboards. I used to have whiteboards all around me and be with pictures of clients and just like oh <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, I miss those days. You know, but I mean, so much harder to keep everybody in mind. And now it's just, yeah, we need a CRM and your CRM sounds pretty impressive. I don't know what you call it, but you know, I forgot the name, but 
Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a software that I, that I created. To, but again, I think a lot of people, when they see our site, they think that we're a dating tech app. We're not, mm -hmm. I'm still a personal match maker. I probably shouldn't even talk about the tech because when I built it, it was, I thought I was going to be bridging the gap between the dating apps and personal matchmaking. I was on a, like a mission to solve mm -hmm. this problem. Like there was a broken link and I wanted to solve it. Um, and then I realized, wait a minute, <laughs> I didn't de really develop that for the world, the client. I developed that for me so that yes. I could run, um, so that I could keep track of everything. I had an efficiency model for myself um, and something that was standardized mm -hmm. so that if I'm not in the room and I had a colleague matching my client, it already had my stamp on it, right? Like I was the, um, you know, the, the pharmacist you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the doctor telling the pharmacist what to do, right? Like, here's the prescription, <laughs> go fill it. That's right. Go fill um, it. Yeah. 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 So, uh, I just wanted, I just wanted more accountability and reliability. I think the, I think the industry needs to be way more standardized. It is not, as we know, there's, it's very wild, wild west at times. Mm -hmm. Um, and that kind of bothers me because it's just, it's just too hard to hear people having such vast different experiences across the board of matchmaking. And there's mm -hmm. so many of us now, you know, when I started out, there was no one around. Right. It was, yeah. I mean, no one. Yeah. Um, so I didn't have anybody to model my stuff after. I didn't have anybody to borrow from. I didn't look at anybody's website. My training is like, you'd be a racehorse, put your blinders on and race, go, you know, just your, your own horse. You don't need to look around you to see who's running faster or slower than you. Mm -hmm. But I find that in today's market, people come into this world and they just want to they just want to sort of mimic and shortcut by, can I borrow from you? Can I use your right. leads? Plug can and I play. Plug and play. Yeah. Tell me what to do. Yeah. Um, no, can, I don't, can I design my website after you? So that's that's the hard part um, for me. Yeah. Because I think it takes away from your ability to have longevity in the industry. Absolutely. And, and, and the grit. The grit. Yes. Getting your hands dirty. Like, I don't know. It just, yeah, I I, I wouldn't. I'm happy about the way that I approached it and you approach, I feel like you probably can speak to this too. Like it just, I wouldn't want it any other way because mm -hmm. I get all the ins and outs. I get, I mean, I feel really like so self-possessed, like so mm. and confident yeah. and like, yeah. I know what's, I know what I'm doing. Like I'm so seasoned and you can't, you can't buy that in a course. You can't, you can't read that in a book. Right. That's right. You have to experience it. And one of the things I love about, about um, mm. Dr. Frankie is anything I ask, like from like the trivialest of tasks, she knows it. And I know she knows it because she's done it, right? Or she's created that, the path to get there. So, and and I love that. I was like, I knew she would know that. <laughs> oh, oh, you yeah. never told me that. And I That's appreciate sweet. that. I really do. You know, That's I wonderful. really do. And I think you can spot people like Dr. Frankie too. You know, it's like, it's mm -hmm. when I met you, it's just, it's clear when somebody is, is really seasoned, knows their work, doing it in an ethical way, um, yeah. because that matters more than anything. I mean, reputation in this industry is everything. Everything. And I remember those early days when I started out and I was bootstrapping and I had a meeting at, um, um, <laughs> I had a meeting at, at Disney. Uh, for a possible development deal. And I remember a client of mine, you know, we were talking my first six months on my, on my own. And a client said, yes, I'm sending your check. And I kept going to the PO box day after day after day to open it up with that little key only to find nothing, not a, in that box. And we're talking like, I don't even know if I could have, I would have closed down my bank account because just to get 20 bucks out would have closed down my account. It was really, really lean. <laughs> And I, I remember I had to go to Burbank to this development meeting and they, you know, I was this up and coming matchmaker and they wanted to develop shows around me. So I had to walk in with all this confidence and I get in the car and I looked down at my gas tank after I went to yet oh. another trip to the PO box with zero check in the mail. And I called him and it wasn't that he wasn't doing it, just that he had forgotten, but he didn't right. know that I was suffering. He had no idea. And so I get in the car and I look and my car is on E. Like it's, there's like a mini, like less than a quarter of gas in the day. And I remember crying and going, how am I going to get to Burbank? And then I started laughing because I thought of the Flintstones and how they would drive their cars with their, like they pedal with their feet. 
So I thought I'm going to have to knock out the floorboard of my car. Oh, <laughs> my <laughs> feet. Super big. Um, and then having to walk in there and still have confidence. Right. But for me, it was that same week of all of that scarcity and, and I mean, really lean, lean, lean time. There was a guy that came in that was writing his check for a very large sum of money at our meeting. And I just didn't vibe with this person. I just didn't think I could do it. I didn't respect him. I didn't, I didn't really care for him. He wasn't touching yeah. my heart. And I took my hand and I put it on his and I said, please stop writing the check. I'm not your person. Oof. And I went home and I thought, did I just turn down <laughs> thousands of What's dollars? Wrong with me? <laughs> What's yeah. wrong with me? But every time I did that, I always got a client like out of the blue. But it was that, it was that grit, like you're talking about, Dr. Frankie, that faith and that, you know what? I'm not gonna come from scarcity. I'm That's gonna, right. I'm gonna do this with integrity. I'm gonna take on the clients I know I can serve. Yeah. And, and you're not gonna you sell out. Trust right you're not gonna yeah, yeah. you're not gonna just succumb it. to yeah trust your trust that like okay like the not universe or whatever you believe it it will deliver because we're doing exactly what we're supposed to do we're in alignment right. like, i feel like if you're in alignment there's a net beneath you beneath all of us yep. that's gonna you don't have them. to worry you yeah. don't have to push or pull it it'll and, unfold as it should and we can get now, our clients to understand that. right even that's now we said yeah. All these years in the comp, right? We own our own companies. There's like, you know, there's some ebbs and flows and, you know, and I just, I, I always go, there's the net there. I'm not going to freak out. Everything's going to be fine. And it, it always is fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my husband, my husband's a CFO. He's actually my CFO as well. And uh, he'll say to me, don't, don't you care about money, April? And I said, no, I just don't stress about it. <laughs> there's a difference stressing a difference. is not caring same thing with your love life for everybody who's listening That's just right. because you're stressing and worrying and paying a matchmaker to go do your love life for you doesn't mean that that makes you care anymore sometimes your scarcity and your fear is the crippling part yeah mm. right yeah yes. and i always say like if somebody hires us we're just a partner we're not the boss and we're not responsible for your success really and we're not responsible for your failure and what I mean by that is matchmakers are given way too much responsibility. Yeah. We're given too much responsibility for making that match. Denise, you said earlier, you know, I know a lot of people love the high of the business of like, oh, I made this match. My high comes from, did I get you to a better place emotionally? Absolutely. Than when you came to me as a client, are you a happier mm -hmm. individual? Are you more knowledgeable about yourself? Are you more dateable because you're working with me? right? Are you having a better experience? Are you enjoying the journey of dating people and meeting people? So I feel successful long before I make a match. Yes, exactly. Right? Nice. nice. But it's like that, that it's that other part that is so, so, so important of, um, of that trust that we're all talking about. That's really, that's it for me. Love it. April, how yeah. can people find you? Uh, my company is Level Connections, levelconnections.com. And I always love it when people DM me on Instagram. I have a funky Instagram name, though. <laughs> what is, what is? What's your Instagram name? It's April underscore underscore buyer, B-E-Y-E-R. Some There's an April buyer out there in the world, which is a very rare name. But, you know, she took it. Uh, that's where I... How dare <laughs> her. Uh, <laughs> So that was so smart of you though. You put two underscores and still had no. your, yeah. No, it wasn't smart. It was just default. <laughs> no choice. No choice. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this find your way. You so find your way. Lovely having you exactly. on. Today. Yeah. Well, Love thank it. you both. I really, you know, as we know that this, this world can get a little lonely, right. When all of us are doing this. And every time I, I meet with people like you, we realize that really it's a, it's it's a group of people that are so well intentioned you know um it's been it's been a joy to meet and connect with everyone in this industry um really doing the good work the difficult and the good work and um i'm so honored to be part of it and to be chatting with you both thank you yeah, thank you and thank you everyone for tuning in today and we will see you all next week Big hugs, kisses.
Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye.